<clears throat> well, good morning. I wanted to uh, start off uh, just with a bit of advice for you. I probably, uh, I probably should have given you this advice last night, but uh, you can apply it now. It's from Proverbs 27, uh, verse 14. Uh, and it says this, If one blesses his neighbor with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be counted as a curse to him. All right. So when you get up in the morning, uh, maybe not a loud greeting for your roommates, all right? Uh, they might appreciate that, especially if they're not a morning person. How many of you are morning people? All right. How many of you say, I'm absolutely not a morning person? All right. That's probably the majority. I'd say 60%. So I know it's challenging sometimes here in the mornings and, and even chapel at 8.15 in the morning. It's early, but I'm so grateful uh, for the opportunity that we have uh, to, to uh, open God's Word together and to hear from Him. And so that's my prayer uh, for each of you and for myself that, that this week that we will hear God's voice, that you will hear His call, and that you will know the hope of His call, and that you will have the confidence to, to answer that call. So we're going to be uh, in Luke chapter 5 today. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, we'll get there in just, in just a moment or two. Um, when it comes to focusing, how many of you would say... Focusing is challenging for me. That you have, that you're easily distracted. All right, several of you. How many of you would say, no, I, I, have, in, I have incredible focus. I, I mean, I can just be oblivious to what's around me. I'm so focused. All right, some of you. All right, focus, you know, focus is, is hard for a lot of us. And honestly, for, for all of us, we live in a world where there are so many distractions. Right? And one of the things that that I love about our time at, at Chehi is that we remove a little bit of the regular distractions of life, our, our connections with the internet and, and, and our phones and all the things that, that aren't necessarily bad, but they bring a lot of distraction. And, and one of the things that we, why we do that is because we want you to be able to have a little break from that, but to be able to focus, to focus on God and your relationship with Him, to focus on your music and your growth and to focus on people and to build relationships. And so today as we begin uh, the journey that we're going to be on this week, we begin by, by thinking about God's call on our lives. And I shared Ephesians 2.10 with you last night, right? That we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, right? And so I believe that, that everyone who knows Christ as their Savior, that you're God's masterpiece, but you're not a masterpiece that he intends to hang on the wall and just show off. That you're a masterpiece that he has saved to serve him. He has prepared good works for you. God has a plan for your life. And God has a purpose for your life. And I hope that this week we'll discover that purpose in following the call of God on our life. Now, when it comes to, to following Jesus, what I've learned and discovered is that sometimes it's easy to believe or think that I'm following Jesus, but really I'm just following my idea of what following Jesus should look like, or what my notion of Jesus is. And so this week I want us to see Christ for who He is, and to see His call to follow Him. So join me uh, in Luke chapter 5, and, and I invite you to use your imagination a little bit with me. Uh, I, I believe that our imaginations are a wonderful gift from God. Anybody agree with that? All right. Uh, and, and I want you to imagine yourself on a sun-soaked shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. So I just, it, just picture yourself there. I was, I was blessed to go there several, several years ago now uh, and actually be in the location that we're going to be in in Luke chapter 5. And so on this beautiful sunny morning around the Sea of Galilee, it's a, it's a huge, well, not just a huge, it's a freshwater lake. It's about 8 miles long, about 14 miles wide. Uh, or either way, you could go with the dimensions, 14 miles long, 8 miles wide. Depends how you're looking at it, right? And so it's a, it's a big lake. And around this lake, a lot of Jesus' life and ministry take place. And so I, I just want you to picture yourself. Maybe we can just join in on that shoreline this morning and listen into an amazing scene in the life of Jesus. So Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret, which is also the Sea of Galilee. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake, and the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the land, and then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. 
So let's just, let's just pause and, and think a little bit about the scene that we are entering. So there's Jesus on the shoreline of this lake, and there's some huge crowds that have come. And these crowds, they, they are as excited as you guys were last night during introductions, all right? I mean, they, they are excited. They're, they're enthusiastic, and they're pressing in to get as close to Jesus as possible. And there, there's a real buzz in the crowd. There, there's energy. And, and so we might step back and say, well, why? Why is there this buzz? Why is there this energy? What, why is there this crowd pressing around Jesus? Well, it is early on in Jesus' public ministry. And as Jesus has begun his public ministry, he's begun to teach in the synagogues around Galilee. He said things that were startling. He said things that were shocking. In fact, he had said things even recently in a synagogue as he read from Isaiah and said, today this, this scripture is fulfilled in your words. There, there were people who tried to kill him. Right? They tried to push him off a cliff, but Jesus just said, excuse me, and he went about his day. So I always have been fascinated with that passage. It said the whole crowd was ready to push him off the cliff, and he just said, no, excuse me, I, I have to go. And it reminds us that even Jesus' death on the cross was not, he was not a victim, right? Jesus willingly laid down his life. And so there, there's, been, there's been incredible teaching. There have been miracles, right? There have been people healed, right? And so there, there is a buzz going on around town. They didn't, as far as I know, have cell phones back then, right? But, but word spread, right? And so there's, there's excitement. There, there's, there's a desire to hear Jesus, to be around him. And so there's this big crowd pressing in, and Jesus doesn't even have room to, to teach. And so he sees Simon, Peter, and he asks him if he can borrow his boat and so that he can get out a little bit from the shoreline so he has room to teach. Now, I want us to think about this from Peter's perspective, from Simon's perspective. Right? He has been up all night fishing. And anyone have guessed how many fish he caught? That's right. The big zero. All right? No fish. Right, so I want you to imagine you've been up all night working and you've had a bad night at work, right? You've accomplished nothing. And now, you know, you have, you know, so that means there's going to be no income today. The nets still have to be washed. The work still has to be done. And Jesus now is going to interrupt Peter's day. And he's going to say, Simon, hey, can, can you row me out so I can preach? Right, and if you put yourself in Simon's sandals, are you with me? Right, this, this, is kind of a, this is kind of an interruption. You know, you're tired, you're finishing up your work, and, and, and Simon has heard about Jesus. Right? His, his brother Andrew introduced him to him. He, is, he has come to believe that he very well may be the Messiah. And so Simon knows Jesus. He, he has uh, respect for Jesus. But this is, this is an interruption. And you know, many times we face interruptions in life, don't we? Things don't go the way we planned. Things don't go the way that we would want them to have gone. Things don't go the way we dreamed or imagined that they would have gone or should have gone. Can you relate to that? And so this interruption is actually from God. Sometimes interruptions are our own doing or someone else's doing, but sometimes God interrupts your life. And when God interrupts your life, it's always for a purpose. You see, Jesus didn't just need some space to teach. He was also using this moment to do something in Simon's life. And so he interrupts his life. And so Simon obliges. I'm sure he's tired, but he rows him out. And he sits there while Jesus teaches. And I imagine that morning sunshine felt good. And Jesus is talking. And Simon probably began to get what? Sleepy. All right. Yes, he's tired. He's been up all night. But he listens. And he listens patiently. And then Jesus wraps up his message in conclusion, right? And Peter's like, yes, right? I, I, loved, I loved that it was a great message, but I'm tired, and I just want to go home and go what? To sleep. So he's heard the message. He's listened. And now notice what happens in verse 4. He says, when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. And at this, Simon says, Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. And I imagine 
in my, my understanding of how it went down, there was a bit of a pause right here. And then he says, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. You know, I'm sure there were a lot of things going through Peter's mind at this moment. Are you with me? Right? I'm sure things like, I have worked hard all night and I'm really tired. Is this really a good time? I know a lot more about fishing than a carpenter does. Right? I mean, Jesus obviously is a masterful teacher and he grew up in, in Joseph's home, in a carpenter's home, and so he certainly has those skills. But I'm not sure Jesus really knows about fishing because the best fishing was at night. And it was in the shallows where they could easily be reached with their nets. But now it's daytime. The fish are out in the deep. And besides that, fishing stunk last night. Right? And so this is not a great time to go fishing. And then he's probably thinking, we've already washed our nets. Right? If, if, we, if we throw the nets in, we're going to we're gonna have to go through all that process again. And then here's the thing. There was a big crowd of people there. And Peter, Simon, is probably is well known in the community. Right? He's well known as a fisherman. And everyone would have thought that he was what? For going fishing in the daytime in the deep. Crazy. Crazy. Right? And we all know like, what it's like to deal with peer pressure and what people think about us. And so Peter has to make a decision. I'm going to look foolish fishing in the daytime. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And so I am positive that many of these thoughts, or even all of these thoughts, were probably running through Peter's mind. But notice what he does. He says what? But, where your translation may say, nevertheless. Nevertheless, even though this doesn't make any sense. Even though this, this seems crazy. And even though everyone's probably going to make fun of me. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the nets. And so we might say that while... Jesus asking Simon to take him out of the boat when he was tired was inconvenient. We might now say that this was improbable. Right? Improbable. There's not any great likelihood that this is going to be successful. And Peter probably has no idea even really why Jesus wants him to do this. Right? You know, we all love to ask why questions. How many of you pe pestered your parents? It's hard to get that out in the morning. Pestered your parents with why questions when you were growing up. All right? Right? It's natural. Right? Why? We're going to do this. Why? What? Go brush your teeth. Why? Right? I mean, we just, we have why questions about everything. And that's good. That's normal. It's how we are. But God doesn't always answer our why questions ahead of time. Sometimes he's going to ask you and invite you to trust him without knowing all of the why. And so Peter doesn't know the why at this moment. But he says, nevertheless, even though I don't understand why, and even though there's no reason why this makes sense, and I'm probably going to get made fun of, nevertheless, at your word, I'll do what is improbable. And notice, notice what happens in verse 6. It says, when they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And so immediately, something extraordinary happens, right? The nets are so full of fish, and they, they yell out to their partners, James and John, to come help them. And, and they row out, and they start filling, you know, they start emptying the nets, and the boats are so full of fish that they begin to sink. And notice, as this happens, Simon realizes that something supernatural is taking place. He knows this isn't just good luck. He knows this isn't just a, a, a fisherman's stroke of, of genius, right? He realizes that something supernatural is taking place. And so look at verse 8. It says, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. Right? In this moment, you know, Peter, before this, has recognized that Jesus is teaching is, is extraordinary. He has seen the supernatural miracles. His own mother-in-law had been healed and raised up from a, from a sickness that was leading to death. And so he knows that Jesus is powerful. And he had believed his brother's testimony that Jesus was the Messiah. But now he realizes that he is in the presence of something more holy and more awesome than he has ever encountered in his life. And in that presence, Peter feels the weight of his sin and the weight of his unworthiness. And he says, go away from me. 
I, I, I don't deserve to be in your presence. As we read on in verse 9, we notice that not only was Peter amazed, but look at this, it says, For he and all who were with him were amazed. Right, amazed. They were startled. This was not normal. At the catch of fish that they took. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. You know, it takes a lot to impress other fishermen, right? I, I grew up loving to fish. I even ended up giving a couple fishing lessons last week at the pond. And believe it or not, there are fish in that pond. They're not very big, but we caught some, all right? But it takes a lot to impress a fisherman, Right? Fishermen by nature do not believe other fishermen because fishermen usually what? Lie, tell tales, right? But everyone saw this and they were amazed. But the point of all of this was not about fish or fishing. Notice what happens in verse 10, or the second half of verse 10. Jesus says, don't be afraid to Peter, to Simon. Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. And then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. They brought their boats to land, left everything, and followed him. And this becomes a pivotal moment. And in this moment, we realize that, that Jesus interrupting Simon's life that morning wasn't just so that he could have space to teach, although he needed that. But he was doing something in Simon's life and he was about to change his life forever. And so he interrupts his life to get his attention. You know, sometimes God has to interrupt us to get our attention. And then he asks him to do something improbable. Go fishing in the daytime. And it doesn't make sense, but Peter obeys. And that obedience led to him seeing the power of God in his life. Right? He realized that what happened that day was not natural, it was supernatural. He saw the power of God. And when he saw the power of God, it gave him the ability, the faith, to do what came next. Which we might say was something inconceivable. All right? If you've seen The Princess Bride, right, which is the most amazing movie ever made, right? Can we agree on that? And you're familiar with the word inconceivable, and I won't try to, I, I won't try to pronounce it because I, I won't, I won't do it justice. All right, but you can imagine, you know how he sounded, right? Inconceivable, right? Over and over, inconceivable. But really, what Jesus is going to ask Peter is really inconceivable. Peter, I want you to leave your livelihood, your income. I want you to leave everything that you know, your comforts. And I want you to follow me. And it says he left everything and followed him. He obeyed him when it was inconvenient. He'd been called when, and obeyed him when it was improbable. And now he's going to obey, obey him when it's inconceivable. I mean, just think about the, probably the thousands of dollars of fish right, that they left. right? The, the, the security, the safety to a life of unknowns. And I promise you this, that, that Peter, right, if he could talk to you today, would tell you that it was a decision that he never looked back on and he never regretted. Because he came to know and believe and trust and experience that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He was an eyewitness to his life, to his miracles, to his death, and to his resurrection. And Peter's life was, was transformed. And so this morning, as we think about our own lives, right, we look at this story and we say, man, that's incredible, right? It's incredible that, that God would go to a, a fisherman, a blue-collar guy, no, no, no formal education, right? He, he hadn't gone to, to the right schools or wasn't from Jerusalem where most of the, the teachers and the rabbis would seek out uh, prestige and honor. And he calls him. And that's amazing. But here's what I want you to know, every single one of you, that Jesus extends a call to you as well and to me. He extends the same invitation to follow Him. And so I want you to know that you have been invited. You have been invited to follow Jesus. You've been given an invitation. 
And I just want you to imagine, right? Use that imagination again for a moment. I want you to imagine Jesus, however you picture him. None of us know what Jesus actually looked like, despite all the paintings, right? They were painted years and years and years and years after he lived. So we don't know what his physical appearance looked like. But I just want you to picture Jesus. And I want you to picture him inviting you to follow me. Because he is, and he has. He's inviting you to follow Him and to live a life of knowing Him and of serving Him and worshiping Him. So what does it require? Well, we're going to talk about that throughout the week. But following Jesus requires a willingness to trust Him. Following Jesus requires a willingness to trust Him. Right? Simon had to trust Jesus. It's inconvenient right now, but Simon, could we use your boat? Simon, I want you to launch out into the deep and, and cast out your nets. That's really crazy, Jesus, but okay. Simon, I, I want you to follow me. I want you to leave everything that you know and be my disciple. Following Jesus requires a willingness to trust Him. Trust Jesus when it's inconvenient, right? There are going to be times that we have to trust Jesus when it is inconvenient. Right? When it's not, it's not exactly what we feel like doing. Right? Your feelings are wonderful. They're an important part of who you are. But your feelings are not always to be followed. Right? God calls us to follow Him, not just our feelings. And so it's easy sometimes to make excuses. Right? I hear the call to follow Jesus, but not right now. Maybe when it's more convenient and it fits into my schedule better. It's easy to put it off. I want to invite you to trust Jesus, though, not just when it's inconvenient, but when it's improbable, right? And here it's easy to rationalize, right? To rash Have you ever rationalized your way out of something, right? Either something that you knew God already said or something that God was prompting you to do, but you began to rationalize why you didn't have to do it or why you shouldn't do it or why it wasn't a good idea and maybe even got other people to try to help justify your rationalization. Jesus doesn't call us to rationalize, but to trust Him. And Jesus calls us to trust Him even when it's inconceivable. Right? Even when it's inconceivable. When I was a student here, and I shared this testimony with you a little bit last week, but I felt God calling me to serve Him in, in some sort of vocational ministry way. And that was inconceivable to me. Right? That, that, that just blew my mind. I, I just thought, that, that is crazy. And I resisted that call for a long time. I resisted that call. And, and some of it was because maybe like Peter, I felt unworthy. I did not feel worthy. And here's the thing. None of us are worthy, right? Jesus is worthy, right? But if you have Christ living in you, you have the worthiness of Christ. And that's the basis for his calling on our life. God didn't call me to serve him because I was good. God didn't call me to serve him because of anything in me. He called me to serve him because it was his choice and his pleasure. Right? It was His will, not mine. And it wasn't about me, it was about Him. And so, I want to invite you to really consider, to say, God, this week, help me to hear your call on my life. And I'm praying that, that this week you will experience Christ. That you'll experience His presence and His power. That you'll experience His love and His grace and His mercy. And that you'll know His call on your life. You know, these are difficult days that we live in. You live in a difficult world. You live in a dark world. You live in a challenging world. And yes, we get to take a little break from that. And I love this break. And, and like you, like, I'm never quite ready to leave it. Are you with me? Like there comes a point of exhaustion where we have to leave it. But, but, but we are called to leave this place. And we're called to live. Here's the thing. The world you live in is difficult. It's dark. It's challenging. But God called you to live in this day. You are alive right now because God intended for you to be alive right now. You're living right now because God destined you for these days. And He wants you in these difficult days to know Him, to know His grace and His mercy and His love, to respond to His call and to live for Him. And I want you to not only hear His call and not only to count the cost that we'll consider this week, to become confident in who He is so that you can pursue that call on your life. So here's a question as we think about the inconvenience, the improbability, right? 
the inconceivableness of following Christ. As we think about those things, right? As we think about these things, here's the question that I want you to ponder. Right? Is there something I need to leave in order to fully follow Jesus? Is there something I need to leave in order to fully... I, I want you to... I really want you to think about this question, not just in this moment, but maybe write it down. Maybe pray over that. And to think about... For me, you know, when I came to Chehi as a 17-year-old, and I didn't come to I was 17 because I resisted it for a long time, and I wish I had... But when I came to Chehi, I already had my application to culinary school ready to go because it was 12 months of school, an internship, and no more school. And I thought that sounded amazing. And I love to cook. But God, God called me. I had to leave that dream. I had to leave that notion. I had to leave some other things when I, when I said yes to God's call. And that's why I, I struggled with that. But I want to promise you, and, and it was I mean, a couple years ago as I was going through old papers, I found my application. I had saved it as a reminder of God's call in my life. But I, I want you to think about, is there something you need to leave it might be your plans, your dreams. It, it might be a habit. It might be a sinful thing that you're holding on to that you need to let go. Is there something you need to leave? And I want you to pray about that and to seek the Lord about that. And I want to close with this quote that I was reminded of just this morning. It's from Corrie Ted Boom. She uh, was a, a Dutch woman who lived uh, during uh, World War II and through the Nazi uh, terror and her family used to hide Jews that were escaping. And she was eventually found out with her family. She survived a Nazi concentration camp. She was there with her sister who did not survive. She was an amazing woman of faith. And she said this. She said, we are powerless to do a thing. She said, we are powerless to do a thing. When we are powerless to do a thing. It makes more sense when you get the words right. <laughs> When we are powerless to do a thing, it is a great joy that we can come and step inside the ability of Jesus. One of the things that terrified me about serving God was that I couldn't do it. And I was absolutely right. But I didn't have to do it. Right? God empowers us to do what He calls us to do. So that's my hope and my prayer for each of you. That you will hear the call of Jesus. And that you will truly desire to follow Him with all of your life. And listen, you may get a notion of what God wants you to do now, but you may not. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that you are willing to say, Jesus, wherever you lead, I will follow. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. I thank you for this new day that you've given us. I thank you for a fresh week of Chehi. Father, I thank you for all that lies before us. Father, of growth and work as, as new music comes today, as, as lessons begin, as practice happens. Father, I pray for a great day of growth. Father, I pray for relationships to develop. I pray that we would experience your presence together. I pray that we'd experience joy. And Father, I, I look forward to all that you're going to do. But Father, I just pray right now for each student, each counselor, our staff, our faculty, for myself, that we would see you for who you are, that we would hear your call on our lives, and that we would respond in faith. And that we would say yes to you. And that we'd be willing to, to leave everything to follow. And Father, I pray that, that in doing that, we would glorify you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.